I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is a typical day here in Santa Barbara, and I think a lot of us want to make sure we can continue to say this is a typical day in Santa Barbara. And so thank you for joining us. I am thrilled that with me are two esteemed Attorney General colleagues who have been working really hard on the subject that we're going to discuss today. We hope to be joined by another of our colleagues. We're here gathering as attorneys general from throughout the country to meet and discuss subjects that are important to the uh, world of attorneys general and to our state and to our people. But we're here specifically this morning uh, to talk about something that's very important to those who care about the well-being of our people and certainly the well-being of the environment of this country and the economy of our great nation. With me are Tom Miller, the Attorney General from Iowa, who will speak after I uh, finish, and by Ellen Rosenblum, the Attorney General of Oregon, who will speak after A.G. Miller. If we're lucky and we strike gold and uh, Attorney General Phil Weiser of Colorado makes it, we will ask him to say some remarks as well. Uh, where's Tim? Tim Sullivan, where's Tim? Tim, come on over. I want to make sure that Tim Sullivan from my office uh, is standing with us because, quite honestly, if you get too technical on us, we're going to ask Tim to take over because Tim has been at the heart of this case working it very hard, and the nuts and bolts, uh, he can answer far better than either one of us could. So I want Tim to be here as well. Nearly 50 years ago, Congress directed the Environmental Protection Agency to address sources of pollution that endangered public health and welfare. It is settled law now today that those sources of pollution include carbon dioxide emitting power plants, the single largest stationary source of carbon dioxide in America. When it comes to addressing those power plants pollution, we still have work to do. The Clean Power Plan represented a meaningful step in the right direction. This is a plan that was worked out several years ago. Many stakeholders, many governments working together to come up with a plan to tackle the carbon pollution problem. This plan would have cut the electricity sector's carbon pollution from 2005 levels by approximately one-third by the year 2030. That would have significantly reduced emissions in this country. But it's not just about saving the environment. It's about saving lives. The Clean Power Plan would have helped prevent thousands of premature deaths in our nation every year. The EPA and the Trump administration know climate change is real. At least they should. They said so in their own national climate assessment report that they worked on. But now, four years after the Clean Power Plan was adopted, the EPA has moved to repeal and replace it with the so-called Affordable Clean Energy Rule, a toothless substitute. Make no mistake, EPA and the Trump administration are backsliding once again. They're bending over to special interests at the expense of the public's interest. EPA is replacing the Clean Power Plan with what I would call the Fossil Fuel Protection Plan. Let's be clear. This move is more than ill-advised. It is unlawful. It is unlawful for at least three particular reasons. First, repealing the Clean Power Plan and attempting to replace it with an alternative that does not meaningfully reduce power plants, greenhouse gas emissions would violate the EPA's duty under the Clean Air Act to address carbon pollution from power plants. Second, this new uh, fossil fuel protection plan attempts to artificially narrow the EPA's regulatory authority under the Clean Air Act. That runs co uh, directly contrary to Congress's intent that the EPA have broad authority to address monumental sources of energy and air pollution. Finally, the Clean Air Act requires the EPA to utilize the best system of emissions reduction possible. And from what we've seen, 
This new rule does just the opposite. This administration and the EPA may be calling their plan the Affordable Clean Energy Plan, but there is nothing clean or affordable about it. That's why we're here today. President Trump and his fossil fuel protection plan might lack the courage to take on climate change, but we don't. We're here to say it's time to act. We're here to protect the gains that were made and are reflected in the Clean Power Plan. Until this administra administration takes meaningful action, our coalition of states will continue to do whatever it takes to defend our people, our people's health, and our environment. Because we want, as I said at the very beginning, for Santa Barbara to look like this every day. We want people to enjoy Santa Barbara like this into the future. We want our children to know what we've got to know that Santa Barbara is like. We don't believe whether you're in Iowa, whether you're in Oregon, whether you're in Colorado, whether you're in California, that your children will never have an opportunity to understand the beauty and majesty of what this great nation offers. It is our responsibility to protect our people to protect our resources and our environment, and we're ready to do it. With that, let me now ask uh, Attorney General Tom Miller to say some remarks. <clears throat> thank you, Javier, and thank you for, for your great leadership on this issue and, and, and so many issues. Uh, Javier has, has very quickly become one of the key leaders of the Attorney Generals throughout this country, and you, you can see it, uh, you see it today and in, in, many other, in many other ways. Well, I want to take this opportunity in beautiful California to talk about the jewel of the Midwest, Iowa, and how this decision unfortunately affects Iowa. Um, Iowa bought in heavily uh, to the Clean Power Plan, uh, the plan of the Obama administration. It was working and would work very well for Iowa, and let me tell you why. Um, we, we, would, we would be able to come into compliance uh, with, the, with the goals for Iowa quite readily because of wind power. Iowa has seized wind energy in an incredible way. Um, last year, 34% of the electricity generated in Iowa came from, from wind, um, you know, a slightly more than, than, than a third. Um, and the potential for even a greater percentage uh, exist and let, let me tell you how that works and why that's the case. Iowa has has two major power plants, uh, two major power companies, uh, and then uh, rural elective cooperatives and, and other smaller ones. The largest one is is Mid American. Mid American has taken the leadership in the country on wind energy. Um, they uh, they they currently uh, are are producing enormous amounts of wind energy. But the future is what's to keep in mind. They just got approval for their their tenth their tenth installation of, of wind energy in, in our state, and when that is com completed in a couple years, they will have the capacity to generate 100 percent of electricity uh, from wind. Now they can't do that all the time uh, because of weather conditions, but the potential is there, and that 34 percent is just going to grow and grow and grow. Alliant, our our other our other uh, major utility um, is behind, but but they're growing. They're 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 in into wind and, and and doing more and more of that. And Mid America also tells me that that once the technology on batteries, um, you know, uh, increases and and that that's much more feasible. They're going headlong into solar at that point with when when batteries are are, are available. So Iowa has this ongoing use of 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 wind energy, potential for more wind, for more solar, we can comply with those provisions um, that were in the Clean Power Plan and um, can do so readily. Now, the downside is that, that Iowa is affected by climate change um, in, in a host of ways, uh, but the most significant um, is in the area of, of flooding um, and droughts, the worst of, the worst of both worlds. Uh, we've had enormous flooding in our state this year, uh, particularly along the western part of our state, uh, with farms still flooded, some towns still flooded, uh, two and three months later. 
Um, the Mississippi is is flooding uh, on on the other end uh, other end of our state. Uh, corn planting is is way behind the usual uh, practice uh, because of because of the rain that that has uh, that has stopped that and and made made it necessary to do it over again. Um, and and the when we do have uh, droughts, they're more severe. In 2017, we had a we had a very significant drought. Um, this is part of climate change, and we're paying a, we're paying a cost, and we're prepared to do what's necessary to undo that with the Obama Clean Power Plan. So that's why we're very strong supporters of the previous rule. Can see it work. Can see how we can comply. Can see how it'll make a difference for Iowans. Uh, so Javier, I, I join with you and Ellen um, in in a, a, objecting to the the Trump plan and advocating going back to the Clean Power Plan, uh, which will make a big difference uh, in Iowa. With that, I want to turn it over to Ellen Rosenblum. Ellen is, of course, one of our other leaders, leader of the Democratic AGs, and uh, been very active in a lot of issues, including this issue, Ellen. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Well, it's great to be here in California. This is where I was born, although I'm the Attorney General of Oregon. And then I grew up in the Midwest. Yeah, you always claimed Illinois when I was around. I wasn't born in Illinois. I was raised there. These are the discussions uh, we have so in these AG meetings. We have a lot in common. We share this beautiful ocean. And I want all the babies who are born here in this state and in all our states to be able to enjoy the beauty uh, that we have, especially here in the West. Uh, but everywhere, and it's great now to have our colleague uh, Phil Weiser with us from Colorado, who will be speaking after me. So thank you for having me here today. Uh, it's we're having a great meeting, by the way, of attorneys general from all over the country uh, here in Santa Barbara. And thank you for the rain because it reminds me of home. Uh, and of course, we couldn't have picked a more fitting place, this beautiful Pacific Ocean, to discuss how detrimental the Trump administration's revised clean power plan, if it is adopted, will be to our planet, let alone unlawful. Uh, this administration has gone to great lengths to deny climate disruption and its global consequences. And as part of their repeated attacks on science, they have said that in future govern re government reports, they will stop the scientists from talking about worst case scenarios. But here's the thing, Mr. President, the worst case scenario will happen if we keep burning fossil fuels as fast as we are now, which is exactly what this administration is trying to do with this new plan. And I love your name for it. The only way to avoid the worst case scenario is if we all continue to work together to implement responsible things like President Obama's clean power plan, not easing these protections like the new power plan wants to do. By repealing the clean power plan and rolling back emissions standards for cars and a host of other bad policies, this administration is doing everything it can to make the worst case scenario a reality. The original Clean Power Plan said that all the states should do the kinds of things Oregon is already doing, like phasing out coal and using more renewable energy, something we are very proud of. But the new plan issued today says, no, forget it. Instead, let's just make coal plants a tiny bit more efficient. Well, that does not work for Oregon, and it should not work for any other state. We are already seeing significant harmful impacts from climate change in Oregon. Oregon's shellfish and seafood industries, which are a backbone of our coastal communities, are being harmed by ocean acidification. The increasingly common massive forest fires up and down the West Coast, and certainly here in California, are impacting our timber industry, not to mention our air quality. In southern Oregon last year, we heard from parents who did not want their children to play outside from about the 4th of July until Labor Day because of the continuous forest fires and the poor air quality. Do we want to live in a world where children cannot play outside during the summer? If the president's plan goes into effect and it's not stopped, Oregon can expect to experience more unusually warm winters, decreasing snowpack, and warmer springs that accelerate melting snowpack with significant impact on water availability for agriculture. 
Increased water temperatures will cause more frequent algae blooms and other contamination issues affecting the safety of drinking water across our states. And as we pointed out in our October comment letter, in 2015, Oregon experienced the warmest year ever since record keeping began in 1895. Precipitation during the winter of that year was near normal, but winter temperatures were five to six degrees above average and caused record low snowpack across the state. Drought impacts across Oregon were widespread and diverse. Most people don't think of Oregon as having drought, right? But we do just like you do. Farmers in eastern Oregon's Treasure Valley received a third of their normal irrigation water because the Owyhee Reservoir received inadequate supply for the third year in a row. People near the upper Klamath Lake were warned not to touch the water, not to touch it, as algal blooms that thrived in the low flows and warm waters produced extremely high toxin levels. And more than half of the spring spawning salmon in the Columbia River perished likely due to a disease that thrived in the unusually warm waters. And the list could go on. But all of these stats and stories beg the question, is this the world we want to live in? Climate change is having significant detrimental impacts in Oregon today. And we must immediately take significant steps to eliminate the source of climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions to keep these impacts from worsening. The lawsuit we will be filing in the coming weeks is one more step that we can take as state attorneys general, cities, counties, and local governments to combat climate disruption. We no longer have the luxury of waiting, and we must make these changes now. There is just simply too much at stake, and I'm very proud that in Oregon we are on our way, hopefully, to passing a cap-and-trade law in the next week to two weeks uh, that will also contribute to hopefully solving this scourge and this problem that the federal government today not only doesn't recognize, but is making even worse. Thank you so much for having me here today with you. Oh, and let me introduce our, our last speaker, uh, our colleague, our wonderful newest colleague from Colorado, Phil Weiser, Attorney General of that great state. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you all for being here. In Colorado, climate change is real and we see it every day. Our natural snowpack over the last 20 years has declined radically, creating huge issues for us on the waterfront. We're threatened, how do we manage our water with less of it, and that's a direct result of climate change, which is why Colorado has been long committed to moving to a clean energy economy. We should recognize the origin of the commitment to the clean power plan comes from state AGs. Our predecessors, although Tom was one of them, who filed an action against the EPA, culminating in Massachusetts versus the EPA, making clear that the Clean Air Act says when you have a harmful pollutant, such as carbon, the EPA has to address it. That's what President Obama did, recognizing the imperative of moving to a clean energy economy that can address what is a threat to our lives and, most importantly, our children's lives. Those are the facts. Here's also a fact. Every country in the world of any size or significance other than the United States of America is part of the Paris Climate Accords, but not the United States of America. Well, the states are acting as protectors of their people, protectors of our land, air, and water to address climate change, which is why I am committed to this national imperative and in Colorado, we're leading the way. Our major utility, Excel Energy, is taking huge strides to change our sources of power towards clean energy, working on solutions like storage and, like California, the electrification of our vehicle fleet. The states are right now the leaders in addressing what is a moral imperative, an economic imperative, and obviously an ecological imperative. I'm honored to be with such leaders today and we will do our part in Colorado to lead the way, even when Washington is failing to do so. So I want to thank uh, A.G. Weiser for, for making it. Uh, yeah. we, we, we kept announcing your presence, uh, and so we're, we're glad you were able to make it to A.G. Miller, A.G. Rosenblum. Thank you so much for your leadership. 
I, I just was asking Tim from my office, uh, how many member states are there as part of this coalition? And there were 18 states that signed on to the comment letter that we submitted to the administration, urging them to rethink their proposal and to not backslide once again on protecting our people. And so, as uh, A.G. Rosenblum mentioned, in the coming weeks, we're going to do everything we need to do to be prepared to take on this latest assault on our people, their health, and our, our environment. And so with that, we'll take any questions.